And it's actually interesting. The, the first parading mystic society was the crew of the Calbellian de Rankin Society, I believe is how it was pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> and they were the first group that sort of paraded. It actually started as a New Year's Day parade and then eventually sort of merged with the traditional Mardi Gras as part of the Catholic Church. And those same gentlemen that started the Calbellians went to New Orleans a few years later and started parading over there. And then they picked up the celebration and and then it's just grown and become what it is today. So you're saying <laughs> so. Mardi Gras was first in this country Mardi Gras was first celebrated in Mobile and then went to New Orleans. Yes, that's correct. It actually was celebrated first, I believe, if I'm not mistaken with my date, around 1703. Oh, my goodness. Uh, when, when Mobile was still a French colony. We have a great program today. You just heard Ms. Taylor Voltz, the director of the Historic Mobile Preservation Society, located in Mobile, Alabama, describing how and when Mardi Gras celebrations began in the United States. This and much, much more on this episode of Preservation Oaks. So stick around. It's going to be a good one. Welcome to another episode of Preservation Oaks. In this series, we introduce you to professionals from museums, cultural, genealogical, and historical societies across the United States. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. Happy New Year, everybody. This is Sean Radcliffe coming to you from Salt Lake City, and this is Preservation Oaks, the internationally syndicated original talk program on MicroStream Radio, where we feature interviews with professionals from museums, cultural and heritage institutions, historical and genealogical societies across the United States. Thanks for listening. By the way, our main platform is preservationoaks.podbean.com. But we're also on almost every podcast platform, as well as Odyssey and YouTube. So wherever you listen to the program, I really appreciate it when you like, comment, follow, or subscribe. We're here to give you a better understanding of these precious organizations. We make listeners aware of how the organization is supported, how each is unique to the communities they serve, what programs and events they currently have underway, and what services they offer to the public and their members. We believe the information is vital for people to know how to work with these organizations and how important it is to join, support, volunteer with, and donate to one or more of these societies. Remember that your donations are tax deductible, and many larger companies will even match your donations. That's a great thing. Each guest organization on Preservation Oaks brings with them a truly unique perspective around how they tell the story of their communities how they continue to be relevant for the times in which we live, and what kinds of exhibits and volunteer opportunities they've created. This makes listening to each episode of the program interesting, fun, and diverse. If you're listening and you'd like to be a guest on the program, or if you have questions or comments about the program, spin off an email to preservationoaks at gmail.com. All right, that being said, let's get this show snapping. Our historical January events for this episode January 1st, 1892, Ellis Island in New York Harbor opened. Over 20 million new arrivals to America were processed until its closing in 1954. On January 10th, 1946, the first meeting of the United Nations General Assembly took place in London with delegates from 51 countries. The UN superseded its predecessor, the League of Nations. 
January 25th, 1961, President John F. Kennedy conducted the first ever live televised presidential news conference five days after taking office. January 26, 1994, Romania became the first former Cold War foe to join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization following the collapse of the Soviet Union. And finally, happy birthday to Franklin Delano Roosevelt on January 31st. He was born in 1882 and died in 1945. He was the 32nd U.S. president. He was born in Hyde Park, New York. Despite crippling polio, he led America out of the Great Depression and through World War II and is widely considered to be one of America's three greatest presidents, along with George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. A quote from Mr. Roosevelt, When peace has been broken anywhere, the peace of all countries is in danger, he stated in 1939. Thanks to the History Place website for these events, you can find them at historyplace.com. Here's a couple of jokes. An optimist stays up until midnight to see the new year in. A pessimist stays up to make sure the old year leaves. I was going to quit all my bad habits for the new year, but then I remembered that nobody likes a quitter. Let's drink some tea, Twining's tea, love it. Yeah. Now you can email us anytime at preservationoaks at gmail.com. Preservation Oaks is available for listeners on nearly all podcast platforms, as well as Facebook, Odyssey, and YouTube. On our next episode of Preservation Oaks, we'll be meeting with the Camden Rockport Historical Society located in Rockport, Maine. They have a wonderful organization. The Camden Rockport Historical Society is an organization dedicated to the preservation of the historical legacy of Camden and Rockport, Maine. If you're a resident in the local area, this episode will help you understand what the society has to offer, how you can participate and take advantage of the worthwhile events the society sponsors, and how to best support them by volunteering and donating. Here's a brief biography of our guest today. Ms. Taylor Volz holds a BA in American History from Kennesaw State University and a Master of Preservation Studies from Tulane University School of Architecture. She's a transplant to Mobile from New Orleans, Louisiana. She's keenly focused on the historic Mobile Preservation Society and on supporting the historic Oakley House Museum. Welcome to the program, Taylor, and Happy New Year. Thank you for having me. Happy New Year to you, too. Thank you. Well, I'm all set to learn about Mobile, Alabama and the historic Mobile Preservation Society. So let's get started, okay? Okay. Mardi Gras coming up soon, right? Yes, that's correct. We'll start celebrating on Twelfth Night after Christmas. So it's like the twelfth day after Christmas? Yes. Oh, okay. I thought it was in February for some reason. Uh, so a Mardi Gras Day itself is in, well, it will be in February this year. It actually varies depending on, on the year. But down here in Mobile and in New Orleans, the celebrations start quite early and will go all the way through until Fat Tuesday. Okay. And when is Fat Tuesday? It moves around sort of like Easter, huh? It does. Yes. It is based on whenever Easter is, because uh, it would be 40 days before that. So this year it's going to be Tuesday, February 21st. Okay. And why do they call it Fat Tuesday? Do you know? So I'm not a Catholic, yeah. but from what I understand of living down in these areas where it's celebrated, it is the last day before Lent starts on Ash Wednesday. So Lent is the season where you give up things in the period before Easter. So Fat Tuesday would be the last day of celebration, eating, drinking, basically getting fat, <laughs> if you will. Oh, right, right. Um, before you give up your vices for Lent. I was really surprised that Mobile, Alabama celebrates Mardi Gras. I had always heard of Mardi Gras in New Orleans. That's all over the movies and everything else. Mm -hmm. But I never thought. Mardi Gras was in Mobile, Alabama. That's really pretty mm -hmm. cool. Yep. It, it actually started here in Mobile when the city was a French colony. They started very slowly. And it, it started as just small celebrations around Mardi Gras itself. And it kind of grew from there. And it keeps getting bigger. And there are what we call mystic societies. And those are the organizations that were formed 
to have parties and parades and things like that. And then it just kept growing and growing. And there was a small break in between, especially here in Mobile, when the South was fighting during the Civil War. They still celebrated Mardi Gras, but they didn't have the big parades and the balls and things like that. But you do see it come back after the Civil War and become a big thing again. Wow. And it's actually interesting. The, the first parading mystic society was the crew of the Calbellian de Rankin Society, I believe is how it was pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> and they were the first group that sort of paraded. It actually started as a New Year's Day parade and then eventually sort of merged with the traditional Mardi Gras as part of the Catholic Church. And those same gentlemen that started the Calbellians went to New Orleans a few years later and started parading over there. And then they picked up the celebration and and then it's just grown and become what it is today. So you're saying <laughs> so, Mardi Gras was first in this country, Mardi Gras was first celebrated in Mobile and then went to New Orleans. Yes, that's correct. It actually was celebrated first, I believe, if I'm not mistaken with my date, around 1703. Oh my goodness. Uh when when Mobile was still a French colony. Wow. And so I, I just never have thought much about Mardi Gras at all. But since it's French, so that means the people of France also celebrate Mardi Gras around the same time? Yes. But I honestly don't know much about what they do there. Maybe they just have balls. Maybe they have parades. I really, I really don't know. Yeah, I never um, have seen a news report on, oh, you know, the people of France are celebrating Mardi Gras, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Huh. Interesting. Thank you for that information. That is really sure. interesting. I want to encourage everybody listening to go to your favorite Street View app and just take a walk through downtown Mobile, Alabama. I want to tell you, it's absolutely beautiful. There's huge trees everywhere, especially around the historic Mobile Preservation Society Oakley properties. And there's moss on the trees, there's fountains, there's large stately houses and trees, and it's very nice. You really live in a beautiful part of our country. It is. It is very nice. We're lucky that the city has some ordinances in place that protect, especially the oak trees here in town. You know, you can't just go willy-nilly cutting them down. You have to have the city employs an arborist that comes out, protects things, takes care of stuff just to make sure that those aren't lost. We are lucky to have several oak trees on the Oakley property that are over to, estimated to be over 250 years old. I know, I was um, looking at Street View, so, and right where the, your parking area is on, um, what's that street? It's a street that starts with an R. Um, uh, Roper. Roper, yeah. You mm -hmm. have a parking area there, and on either end of the parking area, there's huge oak trees. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know how big a tree gets, but 150 feet, let's say. No, that's probably not right. Maybe 100 feet tall. And moss all over the huge limbs. and Oh, it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. So what's the history of Mobile County, where Mobile, Alabama is located? It really started with the city being founded first before the county came around it later. It kind of all sort of goes together okay. <laughs> a little bit. If it's okay with you, I'll probably start with the city founding first and then go out from there. Is that okay? Yeah, please do. Okay. So let me go in with my caveat here that I am not originally from Mobile. So I've, I've lived here for two and a half years. Before this, I lived in New Orleans for 11 years. So, you know, I've had quite a bit of stuff I've had to learn, but luckily a lot of the history is very similar as far as who founded it, who controlled the territories and things like that. Mobile is often called the city of Six Flags. It's also called the Azalea City, which is fun fact. Azaleas are actually not native to this area of the country, but oh, really? they grow very prolifically here. But the city of Six Flags, it, it's all the banners that have flown over the city. So we have French, which would, of course, been the founding, and then the British flag, the Spanish flag, there was a short time before the Civil War when Alabama seceded on its own and called itself the Republic of Alabama, which lasted for about 30 days before they joined the Confederacy. Oh. So that would be the fourth flag. The Confederate flag is the fifth flag. And then, of course, the flag of the United States is the sixth flag. So just by that little bit, you can kind of tell 
that there's been a lot of control and changes <laughs> that have gone back and forth in this area of the country that I think a lot of people don't realize. But originally, the city was founded in 1702, and it was actually located upriver of the Mobile River at the 27-mile bluff. That was also the first capital of the French colony, La Louisiane, which would have been this entire area, including the New Orleans territories, which come in a little bit later. Okay. So the brothers that founded the capital and were in control of this first French colony here were the Iberville and Bienville. And unfortunately, that original location founded in 1702 didn't last very long. And they ended up moving the city to its current location in 1711 because of quite a few disease outbreaks and flooding and other issues. And around that time, the population of the city was about 200 people. So it was very much still out on the frontier. And it was moved to its current location, which would be the confluence of the Mobile River and Mobile Bay, which is where we're located at now. A few years later, the capital of the colony, La Louisiane, was moved to Biloxi, and that was 1723. And then eventually it, it is going to move to New Orleans after that, which is also founded by the same two brothers, the Iberville and Bienville. So when you go, when you visit both cities, you will see streets and other things named Bienville, Iberville, and stuff like that. A lot of a lot of the same things cross over in both places. And so the French are going to be here for quite a significant amount of years, about 40 years, until uh, the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763, when Britain receives all the territories east of the Mississippi River from the French. So at that point, Mobile is going to become part of the British West Florida colony. It's going to stay a part of the British colony for, oh gosh, about 10 years or so until we start getting into the Revolutionary War. But eventually, the Spanish are going to enter the Revolutionary War in 1779 as an ally, and they are going to end up taking the majority of what was once the La Louisiane French colony, and it will become Spanish at that point, around 1763 or so. I've got my dates wrong. 1779? Yes. So they're going to take the, the colony at that point, and Mobile will be part of Spanish West Florida until 1813, when it was seized by the United States during the War of 1812. Oh. Um, so that's going to hit your first three major colonies, your French, British, and Spanish, and then it will become part of the United States in 1812. There's so, so much. I think it really does surprise a lot of people to know how much history happened here. There's a really interesting book called The 14th Colony by a local author named Mike Bunn, and he talks about this area where it, it was technically one of the the, we always think of the 13 colonies, but technically there were actually 14 because of the Florida territory and this part of the South that were part of the British control, but it was only for about 10 years. So it's sort of lost in history and it doesn't come up very often when we think of those original 13 colonies. It's totally lost uh, in history. Totally. Yeah. yeah it, it's just, it's just not one of those things that people really talk about, I guess, unless you're very, very specifically focusing on this one region. After it seized by the United States, Alabama becomes a statehood in 1819. And the city of Mobile was up to almost a thousand people <laughs> by that point. Um, but it's going to keep continuing to grow. Cotton is going to become the largest export in the area, using, of course, the plantation economy with slave labor and all of that coming up because it's located on a river and it's a major port city. It's going to be the second largest exporter of cotton after New Orleans here in the United States. And it's just going to continue to keep getting larger and larger and larger. It was the largest slave trading center of Alabama until the 1850s when it was surpassed by Montgomery. Hmm. And of course, by that point, you know, the importing of enslaved peoples was outlawed. And so they were just trading enslaved people that were born here in the United States until, of course, we get to the Clotilda ship that was brought over 
I don't know a ton about the history of that. I believe it was a bet between two gentlemen. And the one guy said, I bet I can bring a whole slave ship over here and nobody will nobody will catch us and we'll be able to do it, even though it's illegal. And he was able to do that. Uh-huh. And they brought the ship partially up the river and unloaded all the enslaved people and then set it on fire and sank it. And of course, they just recently found the ruins of the ship at the bottom of the river. And they're working on, I don't believe they're going to try to raise it just because it's a very dangerous area. And of course, the just the degradation of it taking it out of the water. But they are building a museum that's going to be the Africatown Heritage Museum. And it's going to focus on the Clotilda and that area of North Mobile where the slaves were in the community that they built there during and after the Civil War. So, that's and that's all happening right now, which is super, super exciting. Yeah. We're very excited about that. And then let's see, once we get into the Civil War, of course, as I mentioned, the state is going to secede and become the Republic of Alabama for about a month in February of, I'm not sure the exact year, I want to say 1862, maybe. And of course, there were several battles here in the Bay, including the one that sank the Hunley, which was the very first submarine, uh, which is really interesting. Those were created by a man named Mr. Hunley. I'm sorry, I don't remember his first name. And he invented the first submarine here. And there are actually supposedly several prototypes that are sunk in the Mobile Bay area that they are trying to find, which sounds fascinating to me. (laughs) Unfortunately, every single one of them sank. They they were not really very successful. The one that was most that's most commonly talked about is the HL Hunley. And that one was successful in sinking an actual enemy ship. They basically had these poles and they were all under the water and the poles had a tip of, I guess it was gunpowder or some sort of explosive on the end. And they got right up close next to the ship and just like stuck them out and hit the ship with it. But they also blew themselves up, unfortunately, in the process. So most of those dead are buried in Magnolia Cemetery here in in Mobile. But eventually, of course, the army is going, the Union Army is going to take control of Mobile without too much damage. Uh, You know, it it wasn't a burn, slash and burn like they did in other places. But they are going to take control of the city, I believe, in 1865, if I'm not mistaken. That sounds good. Then, of course... We're going to go into reconstruction and deal with all of that stuff after the Civil War and then move on into the modern era. Yeah. <laughs> the whole town has huge houses throughout. I mean, oh, they're, yeah. they're absolutely beautiful with balconies and things like that. Very cool. Yeah. I think that a, a lot of that comes from, of course, the cotton. But then once cotton sort of doesn't fade out, but it, it's not the big money maker that it used to be, Alabama moved to lumber. And that is now the largest export. And it has been for probably 100 years or so. As we get into the early 20th century, we're getting that lumber money coming in. And then you have those families building large houses around town that are coming from that industry. Again, because it's a port city, so much is coming in and out that a lot of the wealth is going to be focused right in the city itself. Whenever I think of lumber, I think of the Pacific Northwest or North Wisconsin, Michigan, you know, those areas, it's all about lumber as well. I never imagined that Mobile would be a lumber capital. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. Pretty cool. They grow some down here. A lot of it comes from, from a little bit further north because, of course, we are way, way down at the very bottom of the state here. But that that's the largest export now from Alabama. Wow. Didn't know that. Huh. Mm-hmm. You've got a number of historic districts in the area Mm -hmm. and i think that's really cool given your age from 1702 when you were founded that is just fantastic that you've got all the historic districts preserved yeah so mobile has currently has seven national historic districts which are ones that are listed on the national register of historic places and we also have seven local historic districts and the local districts 
were created and they are managed by a part of the city, which is called the Mobile Historic Development Commission. And they handle historic districts. They're also the ones that are going to, you know, handle, they have an architectural review board. So essentially, if you live in one of those districts, you have to have things approved by the review board. It's all exterior. It's nothing inside the house. And it's mostly just to maintain the integrity of the neighborhood. I feel like there's a bit of a stigma around things like this that preservationists really are just wanting, you know, want to tell people what not to paint their house and stuff like that. But it's not really like that. They just want to make sure you're not building, you know, a four story ultra modern glass box in a neighborhood that's full of Victorian Queen Anne's from the 1880s. Absolutely. So that's what the Historic Development Commission does. And we work closely with them on projects. But Oakley is located in the Oakley Garden District, which is one of those seven local districts. And it is named after the house, of course, because it's the oldest building in that neighborhood. And then the districts kind of start downtown and sort of spread out into the suburbs as the city was sort of founded. And I believe they're working on a couple more, adding a couple more local districts to that to include more of the African town and Pritchard neighborhoods, which would be the historic African American neighborhoods as well. Right. I noticed you've got like an Azalea district or an Azalea trail in your area. Yeah. So there is what we call the Azalea Trail. And I don't really know much about the history of it. It's sort of designed where you can drive through certain areas. There's like a map that you can get and you can drive through and see all of the neighborhoods where these beautiful azalea plants bloom in the spring. We have some azaleas on Oakley property, but like I said, they're all over the city and they only bloom for a very short time. It's usually the end of March into April. Mm. And so it's, it's a quick thing. You know, if you, if you're not, if you're not there prepared for it, you'll miss it because they don't continuously do that. And then there's also a group, a youth leadership group called the Azalea Trail Maid for high school seniors. And the girls are named after the flowers and they wear these big poofy dresses that are meant to look like the Azalea flowers. <laughs> uh, that's cool. Uh, thank you for that. What's the history of the Historic Mobile Preservation Society? Ah, yes. The Historic Mobile Preservation Society is the organization that I work for. I am the director, and we have the society and also manage the Historic Oakley House. But the organization was founded actually in 1935 by a woman named Mary Sledge, who was very invested in the preservation and the history of Mobile. She came into it growing up here and saw that things were getting lost as the city was modernizing, and she wanted to make sure that the important stuff would not be lost. And she reached out to some Mobile cultural leaders, other women um, in the society, a prominent figure. and. The direct quote from her is forming the society for the purpose of the protection and preservation of Mobile's beautiful old buildings and other things of historic value. And the name came about in 1935 at the society's third meeting. They decided to call it the Historic Mobile Preservation Society. So they started mostly by placing historic markers and stuff around town and advocating for the preservation of the Church Street Graveyard, Magnolia Cemetery, and other things like that that were not being well taken care of. And then in 1955, they reached an agreement with the city, who actually owns Oakley, to manage and run the Historic House Museum. And so the city owns the property, but everything in it belongs to us. We manage it. We do all the stuff that goes along with it. And we have a bunch of artifacts. And then in 1980, we built the Minnie Mitchell Archive, which is also on the property. And that is available and open to people who want to do research and come and check it out and that sort of thing. So it's been a long time. It's been around a while. And I am proud to be part of this organization. It's an amazing place to work. You should be. So the Minnie Mitchell Archives, is it a separate building altogether? Yes. Yes. Uh, the, the archives building is in its own location. It's right next door to Oakley. It's on the same property. We have about four buildings on, on the property. 
It was constructed in 1980 to contain the paper material items in the collection that belong to the Preservation Society. So there's an entire room that's basically just an archival room, just like you would have at a library or something like that. That has to be very nice to visit. Oh, yes. Yes, it's great. So usually what we do is people call up and they say, oh, I'm looking for something about this thing. I reach out to we have a volunteer archivist that works there and he'll let me know if we have anything on it. And they set up an appointment and they can come in and you know do the research and look at the stuff that we have. But we have uh, the Wilson collection and is a an entire collection of photography that was all taken in the early 20th century here in Mobile that spans probably 20 years of this gentleman's work. And it's, it's a great resource because a lot of those things don't exist anymore. They've been torn down for various reasons. So the photographs are one of the largest parts of the collection that we have. We also have, uh, there was an orphanage here that was located at 911 Dolphin Street. And we have all of the notes and the meeting minutes from that orphanage that were, it was all run by the nuns. And we have all of those records as part of our collection. We also have records for various different organizations in town. We have an entire collection of architectural books that was donated by an architect. There's so much in there. It's just fascinating. I mean, I, I haven't even touched on a minuscule part of it, nor have I even been able to experience all the stuff in there because I don't get to do as much of that kind of research as I would like as part of my job position. But it's a great place. I could spend all my time in there, to be honest with you. Yeah, it sounds great. You know, the Church of Latter-day Saints has family history centers throughout the United States. That almost sounds like you built one specific to Mobile, Alabama, and maybe Mobile County for people to do research in. That's really exciting. Now, you mentioned that you have a number of Alabama markers that the society has placed throughout Mobile, Alabama. Do you actually care for any of those? You go and shine them up once a year and things like that? We have been instrumental in raising the money for those things, getting grants and having them installed, but we don't have a mechanism in place at the moment for the upkeep of the markers. Right now, the main focus of what I have been doing is is the Oakley House, but I'm hoping to expand on doing more community-based things uh, within the next year. So hopefully that will be something. But there's a few that also need to be updated as well. You know, we think of history as being very static, but of course, the more research we do, the more we learn, and then we realize that previously held thoughts may have been incorrect. So that'll be something that we'll be looking more into in the next year or so. Uh, very cool. Taylor, right. it's time for us to take our first break for a few minutes. Okay. All right, listeners, we'll be right back after these important words. We'll be right back to Preservation Oaks with Sean Thomas Radcliffe after these important messages. Explore the rich history of Mobile, Alabama with the historic Mobile Preservation Society and the historic Oakley home located in the heart of Mobile at 300 Oakley Place. Bring your family, bring a friend, or just come on down to learn more about why they love Mobile, Alabama. You can also explore your family history at the Minnie Mitchell Archives on the same property. So, gather your records and your family tree and become a member today. You'll get the help you need and learn about why the historic Mobile Preservation Society and the historic Oakley home is such a valuable resource. For hours, admissions, membership, volunteer opportunities, and contact information, visit them at historicmobile.org. Do yourself and your family a favor by donating, joining, and volunteering today. <laughs> It's time for Preservation Oaks Book Shorts. Book Shorts is a segment of the program where we quickly introduce listeners to authors and books which satisfy your love of history and genealogy, help you with your own research, and finally help you improve the depth and wisdom of your unique family story. On this installment of Book Shorts, we're very honored to be joined by author Marion B. Wood. Marion Burke Wood is an experienced genealogy speaker and active genealogy blogger and the author of the best-selling genealogy book, 
planning a future for your family's past. Her genealogy blog is climbingmyfamilytree.blogspot.com, and she tweets about genealogy from at Marion B. Wood. Marion's special areas of interest are helping people save, curate, and share family history and artifacts. Please join us in welcoming Ms. Marion B. Wood. Marion, welcome to the program. First of all, I'd like to say how awesome your book is. The book's title, Planning a Future for Your Family's Past, is a perfect name for it, and it's a perfect fit for me, and really, for any family historian who is continually trying to stay organized and thinking about how to make sure the work we've been doing isn't lost. I'm going to dive right in here. What motivated you to write the book? Well, thank you for having me. I started writing this book because I had experience with gathering so much research and finally captioning so many photos and realizing if I didn't make a plan for the future, someday I was going to join my ancestors and nobody would know what all this stuff is or what to do with it. And when I went to genealogy society meetings, other folks told me they were grappling with the same situation. So I decided to document my adventures in figuring out how to organize things, get them ready, winnow out things I didn't need to pass to the generations that were going to come, and then make my genealogical will. Fantastic. How can we convey how it can help a family historian? Well, whether you're experienced or you're just starting out in genealogy, you probably have gathered a few things about your family. So I created what I call the PASS process. P stands for prepare by organizing and analyzing. And if you are starting from scratch, this is a great book to help you figure out how to organize and arrange and store what you're going to be collecting. The second step in the past process is to allocate ownership. What I mean by that is not everything has to be in my hands. I realized in most recent years that I could curate my collection the way a museum curator works, because sometimes things could be in somebody else's hand and still be safe. That was the second step. The third step, which is extremely important, is to set up a written genealogical will so that my heirs know what to do with this collection when in the far future I join my ancestors. And so in the book, I talk about how to write down instructions so that people know what we want. Step four can be done at any time in the process. That's sharing family history now. Because as you know, Sean, the more we can tell people now about our ancestors, the more interest we can get in our family history. And just as important, we're making sure that other people are aware that our ancestors had lives and here's what they looked like and who were they. And that's part of our goal for genealogy, right? You bet. I just love the way your book is organized. I picked it up. I was able to make progress immediately, and I was able to understand the past process because it's so well organized for the reader. One of the things I wanted to do was give people the idea that everything doesn't have to be done on day one, two, or three. Life by the inch is a cinch, and life by the yard is hard. So let's do it one little piece at a time. That's why I created a process, not a bunch of ideas. The process helps us feel in control and not overwhelmed. Well, you know, I read the second edition, and I really like that this is the second edition of the book, and I'd like to thank you for spending the time to add and revise the information contained in the book. This really kept it fresh. At the beginning of the book, you discussed the changes made in the second edition, which was great. Are you planning to keep updating the book with future editions as things change? That's a very big possibility. The reason I wrote the second edition is because I had feedback from readers and from people in genealogy groups when I would go to meetings. And they would say, your book is very helpful, but I don't have any clear heirs from my family history. What do I do in that case? So I took a look at the book and reorganized it and created an entire chapter about what you might want to try if you have no obvious heirs. That feedback was so extremely helpful that I'm going to keep listening to readers. If people have more ideas or questions, I might write a third edition to answer those questions. That would be great. I hope the book does evolve in that way. The past process, for me anyway, it was a call to action. And not all at once, not in a rush, but as you said, life by inch is a cinch, life by the yard is hard. 
What advice can you give listeners on how to get started in staying motivated using PASS? My advice is to pick a favorite ancestor or particular surname or family and just focus. So for example, you might want to pick your father's family or just your father and his family. Take a look at what you know about him. See if you can then decide what's the best way for you to have access to all the materials you've collected, whether it's photos, research, original documents, certificates, and put them into an arrangement that allows you to put your hands on anything you want to know at any time. Now, during this process, you may actually find clues because every time you touch a piece of paper or look at a photo, something new might jump out at you that you didn't notice in the past. In that case, those would be bright, shiny objects that I suggest you make a note about. Don't stop your organizational method, but make a note reminding yourself to go back and follow up on that clue. Because the idea of leaving your family history to the future folks isn't just about doing that. It's also about finding out new insights, making new connections. And so research is not going to stop just because you're putting things into a file folder or into an archival box. On the contrary, you're going to find some new clues, as I did every time I touched a piece of paper. Yeah, good point. Very good point. So I got my copy of the book off Amazon. Is that the best place to get a copy of the book? If you want an ebook, you can only buy it from Amazon in the US, the UK, and Canada. But if you want a paperback, it isn't only on Amazon. The paperback is also available from AmericanAncestors.org in their bookstore and online. And the Newberry Library Bookstore in Chicago has it in their bookstore and online. So I hope you'll go looking for it. Fantastic. I'd like to thank you, Marion, very much for your time and for your book. Thank you for having me. And I do appreciate it. And everyone, please start making plans now for the future of your family history. We don't want these important documents and photos to end up in a yard sale or worse, in the recycle bin. That would be terrible. Listeners. You can pick up a copy of this excellent book, and I hope you do. It has real practical advice and prescriptive directions on how to tackle the necessary tasks to organize, curate, preserve, and share your family history. Thank you, Marion, for being a guest on Book Shorts. You come back anytime, okay? Thank you, Sean. All right, fantastic. It's a great book. See ya. Bye-bye. And now, back to Preservation Oak. Welcome back to Preservation Oaks. I'm your host, Sean Radcliffe, and we're here today with Taylor Volts, the director of the Historic Mobile Preservation Society located in Mobile, Alabama. Let's pick up where we left off. Welcome back, Taylor. All right. I'm ready for <laughs> second half. Here we go. <laughs> Taylor, can you please provide the audience with an overview of the communities you serve, the variety of your membership, and the mission and objectives of your society? Sure. So we generally serve the greater Mobile area. The, most of the focus is on the city. We don't, unfortunately, don't have too much of the resources to go further out into the county or other areas. So it is mostly just the city itself we're focused on, but it's a pretty good area of, excuse me, it's not a small space <laughs> around here. Uh, as far as the membership goes, we have a pretty decent variety of membership. Of course, we tend to skew towards the what I would usually call the older generation, just because that seems to be the people that have the time and the interest in in what we're doing. But one of the things that I am focused on right now, and, and especially in the year coming up, is going to be expanding that audience. But I, Because I think there really is, especially on social media, where you have people like cheap old houses and those types of people that are sharing that stuff online and then you have these younger couples coming in and buying big old homes and restoring them. I think there is an interest in in what we do and the history uh, in the younger generation. We just need to tap into it and connect into it. So that's one of the things that I'm, I'm sort of focusing on as far as expanding that stuff that we have with the members. And mission and objective. 
of the Preservation Society. So I'm going to read our mission statement and then sort of expand on it. So our mission is to serve Mobile County by advocating for the preservation of its historic resources, promoting heritage tourism, and providing educational opportunities. And that is the overall mission that we, of course, do. It's, of course, more than that. I mean, <laughs> it's more than just saving the pretty buildings and that sort of thing. That That's kind of the, the overall mission. The objectives that I am focusing on as a relatively new director who's been here about a year and a half, of course, expanding to the younger generation. I'm sort of in the middle. I'm a I'm a uh, an elder millennial, if you will. But you know, a lot of our board members and staff are a little bit younger. And we also have, which I don't think I mentioned, we have an organization called the Mobile Bell, and they are based here at Oakley and at the Richard C A R House, which is another house museum here. They're high school age girls, freshmen through seniors, and they sign up and they learn this history. And they get to be ambassadors to Oakley and the Historic Mobile Preservation Society. They go to events. And they, like I said, they volunteer, they give tours. They also do fun things, you know, like teenage girls like to do, like sleepovers and stuff like that. But utilizing the bells as well to connect with the younger generations and and the technology that they use. But also utilizing it in a way that connects to those other groups of people is good. You know, we've got a handle on Facebook. That's great. Perfect. You know, I've kind of got a handle on Instagram. But we haven't spread into like TikTok. And I've seen other house museums that use TikTok to share information and they make these fun videos. And I just love what they're doing. And I would love, you know, to get started and add that to the kind of stuff that we're doing. Because we have a lot of stuff to share, even things that aren't covered on the regular tour of the house that would be interesting to people. So and that's a that's a big objective for me. And the other thing too is also expanding on the narrative that we tell about the enslaved people. And then later after the Civil War, there were paid servants that lived on the property and nearby that came to Oakley to work. So we're also expanding on that. We had a great intern this last semester that was doing a ton of research for us. We had some basic stories, but there's still more out there to learn. And so expanding that narrative is also a big objective of mine when it comes to just specifically Oakley, but also looking into how else we can help share those stories in the community of course, we, we've offered whatever we can to the History Museum because they're the ones that are doing the, the Clotilda, the Africatown community. But there are things that we can do, other plaques, other events that we can plan that are going to be more inclusive of those other histories and not just African-American history, but other histories in Mobile as well. So that's another big objective for me in this role. That's very cool. But can we do what more information can we find out? What can we share? How can we create these community places, you know, and, and just get more of that information out there? So um, that's, that's kind of what I've been working on. Yeah, that's very exciting. In Mobile, in terms of the historical markers and the historical places, you mentioned that the French were there from 1702 to 1763, then the British, then the Spanish, and so on. Are there buildings or artifacts from each of those eras in the city's history? Yeah, yeah, there is. So there's unfortunately not a ton of French stuff left. There have been two or three fire, major fires here that destroyed a lot of the downtown area at several different times, which, you know, you lose a lot of stuff when that happens as well. Right. And of the port on the bay and, you know, other things like that, stuff disappears. So there, there is a little bit as you go through, you can see, and um, if not specifically like a French building or a British building, uh, you can see those influences in the architecture, you know, a, as things are, are coming up and growing around. And we, there are plaques in different places that commemorate those different types of history. Uh, sometimes there's more than one. There might be one in front of the building, one on the wall of the building, <laughs> you know, those multiple, multiple bits of history. There was a lot of stuff that was lost, of course, because of the fires, but also the city in the 50s and the 60s, you know, there's a big push to modernize the downtown, which happened in a lot of a lot of places. Right. It wasn't that's not a unique thing. But it, during that push, a lot of really interesting buildings, including the old city hall, you know, houses for famous mobilians, uh, such as Octavia Walton Levert, those things were torn down. And now we have these big government complexes in their place. And they they built two tunnels <laughs> and, and a major highway. And, and a lot of stuff just disappears. So 
But of course, ideally, we wouldn't have lost any of those things. But that's just how it goes, yeah. unfortunately. Now, you said you've been in your role for a year and a half. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to do what you do now? Uh, yeah. So I have a bachelor's degree in American history and with a certificate of public history, which is where I got interested in preservation. I actually had to take a preservation class as part of that uh, public history certificate. And I uh, have a master's degree in historic preservation university, um, which is part of the school of architecture there. And after that, uh, my story is kind of interesting. I, I didn't get right into the field. Unfortunately, around that time, it's about 2010, a lot of government programs were shut down, especially in the New Orleans area. You know, they did post Katrina stuff where they were pumping money back in the city and all of that stuff sort of ran out <laughs> around the time when I finished graduate school. And, you know, so I was doing miscellaneous other things because you got to eat, you got to put gas in the car. And not for lack of trying, but in, in the meantime, I was doing a ton of volunteering. I did a lot of conferences and training seminars and traveling and just trying to stay as, as up with what was new and what was happening in preservation as much as possible. And then we moved to Mobile about two and a half years ago. It was right in the middle of the COVID, which was fun. But <laughs> <laughs> And then I got a job at the HMPS and, you know, I went in to the interview and was like, I, you know, I've never done this professionally, but here I am. I have all the experience. I'm very dedicated. I would love to work here. And, you know, they looked at me and they said, you have pink hair, but that's okay. And <laughs> they gave me the job. They took a chance and I am forever grateful for it. And that's kind of how I got here. And I've been doing it for a year and a half and I don't plan to stop anytime soon. So, <laughs> sounds fantastic. Yeah, I, I love it. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be doing it. I wouldn't want to do anything else. Thank you very much for that. Can you tell us a couple of funny or interesting stories from your society's history? I wanted to share, maybe not specific with the society itself, but it does relate to the Oakley House because it has something to do with the last owner of Oakley, who was owned by five different families. And the last family that lived there were the uh, Gwyns. And so the wife's name was Suzanne and her main name was Robinson, but she was married four times. So she was Suzanne Robinson, Goodyear Gwyn, Bacon, Onstead. And her husband was Dr. Henry Gwyn. And they bought Oakley in 1947 and lived there until 1955. And Suzanne was a preservationist at heart. She loved the city. She put a lot of money into restoring the house. And she's the one that actually sold it to the city of Mobile and said this needs to be preserved and used as some sort of learning institution or something like that. And that's how it became a museum. But what's unique about Suzanne, and this is one of my favorite stories to tell about her, you could talk about her all day, but her last husband, his name was Niels Onsted, and he was from Oslo, Norway. He owned a company that built shipping, uh, the cargo ships, the really huge ones uh, that carry all the cargo containers. And he actually named a ship after her. It was called the Suzanne Onsted. And that particular uh, was used as a prop in the 1976 version of King Kong. So if you've seen that movie, The Boat That Brings King Kong to New York City, if you watch it, you can see her name, Suzanne Onsted, on the side of that boat in the movie, which is really kind of fun because I like to tell people she is forever immortalized in film, which is which is really, really neat. So that's that's kind of one of my favorite stories that I like to tell. That's a fabulous tell people. story. Not necessarily about the society itself, but the fun little antidote about Oakley history. That's a really great story. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I read somewhere, and I think it was a FEMA site, because I wondered, you guys being on the coast, you know, you probably have risk for hurricane damage, and FEMA says your risk is relatively high. How do you address that with the society and protect your artifacts? For the house itself, Oakley is built on a very high point and it's not really at risk for flooding. It's up on a little hill. It's the highest point in the neighborhood. So we don't really worry about that too much. The biggest issue, of course, would be the damage from more like wind. And because we have those big oak trees that grow over the house, you know, branches and things like that. So what we usually do if there's a big storm incoming, I actually city um, and they come out and close all of the shutters. We do have functioning shutters. And that actually works surprisingly well, uh, which is kind of what the shutters are for. <laughs> um, that protects the windows and, and things from blowing in and that sort of stuff. 
you know, because it's a historic house, we don't really have those types of facilities that you may find in a museum like a vault or something like that. Uh, that's like waterproof, fireproof. We just, that's just not an option for us because we're in a 200 year old house. So it's mostly battening down the shutters, making sure everything is secure the best. If it looks like it's going to be terribly, terribly bad, you know, we may go and take some items out and move them somewhere else. Um, but, uh, you know, again, it's all giant and portraits and, you know, 10 foot mirrors right. <laughs> and stuff like that. So the archives building works a very similar way, not really risk of flooding because the shutters, but the archives is, is what are in capacity. So it's much better at, at protecting those items uh, that are stored in there. Okay. Very cool. Has it ever been damaged from hurricane? Yeah, there was some, there's been some damage periodically over the years. There was a time between about 1911 and 1960 for a while and that it did have some hurricane damage. But again, it, it was mostly just like wind and, and tree branches and stuff. Just very lucky that the, the water is not, not an issue. But okay. for the most part, it, it's been okay. Fantastic. What kind of exhibits mm-hmm. are on display? We're set up a couple of different ways. So downstairs, we have a rotating exhibit space. So there's a room that we switch out about once a year. We come up with a new exhibit. And when I first started, it was a an exhibit about the history of theater in Mobile. Uh, we have a Mardi Gras exhibit on display right now. The next one's going to be called Mobile Then and Now, where we are going to have a collection of photographs, mostly from that Wilson collection that I was mentioning, of historic Mobile and compare them side by side to what things look like now. So that is something that we produce downstairs, switch it out, keep it interesting, that sort of stuff. Upstairs is the main portion. That stays relatively static because it is, you know, decorated to specific time periods in the history of the house. So the upstairs, you're you're walking through just like a house museum, and you're going to see, you know, chairs, tables, pianos, mirrors, portraits, some small things that belong to the families that live there. So it's not really set up like exhibits like you would think of as such as like a history museum or something like that. It's a little bit different. It's more of more of an immersive space. And we do allow people to walk through the room and not just stand in front of the velvet rope and look into <laughs> the space. So you are able to move through and kind of imagine, you know, hey, this is what it was like before we had electricity and they had to have a bed warmer and they had a mosquito net over the bed and things like that. So it, it's kind of sort of traditional exhibit down more of a, a living history space upstairs. Very cool. Do you have any collections exhibited anywhere else in the area? Uh, right now we don't, but we do often loan things to our institutions in the area, sometimes the history museum, sometimes the art museum. We actually have a portrait of a woman named, of a woman named Alva Vanderbilt, who was from Mobile and she was married to, I believe it was William Jr., and Alva's portrait went to France for a year to be an exhibit about the Vanderbilt, um, some connections that they had with France. And so it's mostly just loaning other things out. We don't usually set up exhibits in other spaces, but uh, you have given me an idea. And I may be working on some more <laughs> partnerships with other organizations. Oh, that's great. I'd like to give the contact information for the Society. You can find them on the web at historicmobile.org. Your physical address of those sites located in the historic Oakley Complex are 300 Oakley Place, Mobile, Alabama, 36604. The historic Oakley House Museum is right next door at 350 Oakley Place, Mobile, Alabama, 36604. You can send them mail at P.O. Box 6711, Mobile, Alabama, 36660. You can call them at 251-432-1281, and you can email them at hmps at bellsouth.net. You'll find them on Facebook as the Historic Mobile Preservation Society, on Instagram as Historic Oakley, and Historic Mobile Preservation. That all sound correct, Taylor? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. We will have another Facebook page, which I forgot to mention before. For Oakley itself, which is the historic Oakley complex, and that's Facebook. Um, but any of those, if you follow us online, you're going to get the same information. To be honest with you, <laughs> I put all the same stuff on on all four of the the things, both Facebook and both Instagram. Okay, thank you for that. Appreciate the update. Mm-hmm. 
Taylor, if your building were to catch fire, what things would you grab on your way out? Uh, <laughs> that's a fun question. And you know, that is not the first time somebody has asked me that. I would probably grab my laptop first, of course, for the business side of things. But there are a few things upstairs that I would try to get if I was by myself. I don't know. Maybe with my assistant or somebody else could help me. Uh, we do have a portrait in our second parlor that is of a woman named Octavia Walton Lever. She was a socialite in Mobile. We have a large collection of things that belong to her portrait, uh, some books that she wrote, the original copies of her books that were published, some other items that belong to her. And so probably those things would be what I would grab first. Her portrait was painted by Thomas Sully, who is a fairly famous artist. He painted George Washington. He painted the portrait of Alexander Hamilton that was used on the $10 bill. Uh, so it's the same artist that did all of those paintings, painted Octavia. That is one of the nicest and finest pieces that we have in our collection. So if I could figure out how to get that out the door, <laughs> that would probably be the first thing that I would grab. Of course, it is about five feet tall and it's about three feet wide and very heavy. Wow. So I would probably need more than one other person. Sounds beautiful. <laughs> but that aside from the laptop, that would be the one thing I would try to get out. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's very cool. And people can see that painting and others if they visit the society? Oh, yes. Wow, that's very cool. Absolutely. It's in the parlor. It's over the piano. It's right there where you can see it. We've, we've actually got a local author named Paula Webb wrote a book about Octavia and the portraits on the front of the book. We have magnet stickers. All kinds of stuff, but yeah, you can you can see it. It's a beautiful painting. She's a lovely woman, but it's also done very well. Taylor, what kind of funding model supports the society, and what are your funding goals this year? We operate a couple of different ways. Since we are owned by the city of Mobile, we do get quarterly funding from them each quarter. That helps with our operating budget. Most of that goes towards uh, my salary, of course, my assistant, and electricity, power, all of those operation type things that you need to run the complex with four buildings on the property. Uh, we also do a lot of grant writing. I say we, I mean mostly me. <laughs> do a lot of grant writing. And the grants are more for special projects and things like that. For example, right now, I recently got some money um, from the Alabama Humanities Association to um, add some signage to our yard and create a tour video. And right now, handicapped access is limited to the house. We do not have an L. Uh, we are exempt from ADA rules because of the age of the property. But that does limit who can visit the upstairs of the house, which is the main part. That's, that's the part you want to see. So I did get funding to hire a local documentary maker, and he is going to film the tour so we can show it to people that can't get upstairs. So I'm really excited about that. And we also get donations from local companies, individual donations, memberships, all of those things, you know, help us survive. We do a couple of big fundraisers throughout the year. We just had had one on uh, our home tour. You know, it, it, it comes in from a variety of places. Unfortunately, we don't have a charitable trust. It would be nice, but nothing was ever set up like that for us. So mostly uh, the government money and grants and then just donations from local people. That's what we rely on. Thank you very much. So folks, listeners in the area, if you're a member of the Historic Mobile Preservation Society, or if you're in the area, please donate, donate, donate. Yes. You mentioned that you had an activity recently for fundraising. What types of fundraising activities does the society offer? Of course, we offer membership. That, that's one of the, the biggest support. Uh, the cost is relatively low, and you get a bunch of benefits from those things. We have a couple of different an under 40 membership, which is $25. We have an individual membership, which is 35 and then a family, which is $55. And then, of course, we do corporate memberships as well, which are $250. Um, and as you go up those levels, you get different varieties of things, including you get uh, free tours, but you also get free admission to certain events. We do monthly lectures and other things that get you in free. You get a 10% discount at the gift shop. Family membership, you get all of those things for up to four people. So that's really the best bang for your buck. If you want to do that, $55 one, you get all that stuff for up to four people at a time, which is pretty, pretty decent. It don't get you discounts for other things, depending on what we're doing. The big special fundraisers, we don't usually do discounts for those because they are special fundraisers. But the, the membership levels are really the best way to support us. But we, of course, have a gift shop. We have uh, columns and cocktails, which is done in October. And that is a huge fundraiser for us. 
the big party. We have a silent auction. We acknowledge and give awards to observationists and organizations and places that we believe have done an exemplary work on preservation in the city of Mobile in some capacity. Sometimes it's one building, sometimes it's an overall project, and we get a lot of support from that. And then in December, we have our holiday home tour, which is where we open Oakley and then people in the Oakley Garden District neighborhood open their homes and you can get a ticket and walk around and see the interior of all those fabulous historic houses that you've driven by but never had a chance to look inside. That's another big fundraiser that we do. And then at the end of the year, we do a big push for end of the year contributions, which is a good way to get things deducted on your taxes because we are a nonprofit contribution are tax deductible. Very cool. So what kind of outreach and education does the society undertake within the community? We do a lot of school field trips at Oakley. We do public schools. We have homeschool kids that come. And that's a really great way for them to learn some local history. But we also, when we have those field trips, the kids learn how to do play a historic game. And they do some fun crafts and other things like that. And of course, I already mentioned the holiday events that we have. We have an event called the Boynton Oak Festival, which is it shares the story of a legend here, a man named Boynton who was convicted and hung for the murder of his best friend. And right before he was hung, he proclaimed that an oak tree, if he was innocent, an oak tree would grow from his grave site. And uh, this was in uh, 1831 or 1832. And indeed, there is a very large oak tree growing from his grave now in uh, the Church Street Cemetery. So whether he was. <laughs> Innocent or not, there is a tree there. And um, so we do the Boynton Oak Festival in May, where we tell his story and do some special tours and kind of promote that. It is a true story, but it's also a little bit of a legend as well, which is kind of fun. So we do, you know, a lot of stuff like that. And as I mentioned earlier, more of this outreach and education type thing are on my list of objectives for the next year. It's growing and, and expanding more beyond our little neighborhood into other areas of town and hopefully being helpful with the New Africa town stuff and, and all of those things. Very cool. And you have school tours that come by in buses or that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. The, the schools will come and they'll send kids and we do like a half day and they get to do, uh, like I mentioned, they get to do a historic game. Sometimes we do a scavenger hunt, which they really love. Like when we take them through the house, you know, we, they find this candelabra or this silver piece and it helps keep them engaged in what's going on and yeah, they're going through. I'd like to set up maybe some more connections with some other house museums or the history museum to, to be able to offer more things like that. It's, it's, a, it's a good organization down here. Yeah, very cool. Thank you for that. Does the Society publish a newsletter? Right now, we're doing an e-newsletter. So it just goes out via email. And it includes information about what we've been doing, events that we have coming up, that sort of thing. It's mostly transitioned into online availability because that's where everything is going <laughs> at the moment. And it is, it does go to members, but also anyone that has, has signed up for other things that goes out. I don't really have a specific publication date. I kind of send it when we have interesting stuff to share and, you know, to let people know about events. So sometimes with, if we've got something big coming up, you may get it several times because I want to push tickets for our fundraiser. And other times it, it might just be once a month for, you know, whatever we've got going on and some links to interesting articles and, and stuff like that. Yeah, that's very cool. Taylor, all of the things I'm about to mention can be fun, especially for volunteers. You mentioned the facilities located within the historic Oakley Complex. Besides those, are there any other things such as libraries or research centers or cemeteries uh, or other community matters that the society manages or cares for? So, of course, we have the Minnie Mitchell Archive, which I mentioned before, uh, which is really the other biggest thing on the property, the other building. And that is open to the public. People can access the things there. We just uh, set you up with our volunteer archivist and he can pull things for you and help you with research. He's a great resource. I don't know what we're going to do if he decides to retire. <laughs> so all of those things that we have, all of that stuff is available to the public. Some of the information is available on our website. We do have a link to um, the archives for the things that have been digitally scanned already. So if you go to historicmobile.org, there's a link that says archives. 
And you can look at quite a bit of stuff that's already been digitized. Anything else, you know, we just say, reach out and we'll try to find it for you. If we can't find it, we can probably give you some leads of other places to, to check. We have two other buildings on our property that are not open to the public at the moment. Unfortunately, um, we have the Cox Easy House, which is a small cottage that was built in the 1850s. We also have a Union Barracks building, which is located behind Oakley. We have a Union camp that was located in Mobile during Reconstruction. And the building was moved to the Oakley property and used as all sorts of things. It was servants' quarters. It was storage. It was even the Oakley gift shop for a number of years. But those, those buildings need something to, to make them safe to be open to the public. So, mm-hmm. unfortunately, uh, we don't have them right now. Although the Cox Bees are a special event, so that's really exciting. We'll be able to have bridal showers and all kinds of stuff in there coming up pretty soon. So, uh, we're pretty excited about that. Um, the Preservation Society is credited for founding the, the Friends of Magnolia Cemetery, which is an, another local nonprofit that helps. Magnolia Cemetery, which is the very large city cemetery that we have here in Mobile. It's one of those big Victorian, beautiful cemeteries. It has a lot of the Civil War dead in there and, and all kinds of unique things in that cemetery. So that group was founded by the HMPS and then went on to grow and become its own nonprofit. And so, you know, they've kind of done great things with being done from there. And of course, we partner with other organizations, like I said, and share information and resources and loan out artifacts, all that stuff. I just try to make it, I try. I want to be as helpful to the community as possible. And so in whatever way we can help people with whatever they're looking for, I will always do my best to try to try to get it done for them. If this was in my capacity, I will work on it. Sounds like a fantastic place for the community to visit and to support. I want to give the contact information one more time before we take our second break. You can find the Historic Mobile Preservation Society on the web at historicmobile.org. The physical address of the sites located in the historic Oakley complex are at 300 Oakley Place, Mobile, Alabama, 36604. That's where the society's home is. Um, The historic Oakley House Museum is right next door at 350 Oakley Place, Mobile, Alabama. The mailing address is P.O. Box 6711, Mobile, Alabama, 36660. You can call them at 251-432-1281. Their email is hmps at bellsouth.net. They're on the Facebook, two different Facebook pages. One is the Historic Mobile Preservation Society, and one is the Historic Oakley Complex. Their Instagram accounts are Historic Oakley and Historic Mobile Preservation. Okay, time for us to take our second break for a few minutes. All right, listeners, we'll be right back after these important messages. This program will now pause for universal identification. Where can you experience hundreds of years of history in a single day? At the Historic Mobile Preservation Society and the Historic Oakley Home. Their mission is to serve Mobile by advocating for the preservation of its historic resources, promoting heritage tourism, and providing educational opportunities that explore its rich history. You'll find something for everyone at the Historic Mobile Preservation Society and the Historic Oakley Home. For hours, admissions, membership, volunteer opportunities, contact information, and much more, visit them at historicmobile.org. You'll be glad you did. Yes, ladies, thousands upon thousands of you from East Coast to West Coast have said how glad you are that your favorite hand lotion, Italian Balm, is back again in the stores. Made exactly as it was before the war. I know a lot of children who are glad, too. Children's hands, wrists, and legs get chapped so easily in winter. 
And Italian balm is so soothing, so protecting on children's tender skin. Men also are glad to have Italian balm back again. Men don't like dry, chapped, red, beefy-looking hands any better than anyone else. And they know that Italian balm, rich, concentrated, clean-smelling, is the lotion to use in the wintertime. It's so different from thin, watery lotion. So economical, too. Remember, just one drop serves both hands. Today, Italian Balm offers the same pre-war quality, same pre-war quantity at the same pre-war price. Can you beat that for hand lotion value? Try it tomorrow. Italian Balm. I started life from fire and wood. I was shipped from the east coast of the new United States to the far west. I went on display at a trading post and was bought by a settler named William. He used me almost every day to rustle up grub for his family. He kept me oiled and cleaned. I was so happy to be so useful. William had a very good aim. He could hit the eye of a coon at 50 paces. When wolves broke into the corral killing livestock, William and I waited one night and took them out one by one. I was deadly in the hands of William. Then, the town we lived in grew and William didn't use me that often any longer. When William died, I was passed to his son Joseph, but Joseph already had a newer model, and so I sat in the closet for a long time, wrapped in oilcloth. Then, finally, after being passed on to several different family members, and then hung up over a fireplace, where I collected dust and soot, I was donated to the local historical society. They catalogued me, shined me up, oiled me, and made sure all my parts worked like new. Now, I'm on display for the community to see every day and they marvel at the way I was made and how long my barrel is. I feel so proud that I can help others understand the past, which I guess I'm now a part of. Rather than throwing it out, please donate historical records and objects to your local historical society today. Nine out of ten family historians agree Preservation Oaks is the best podcast on the internet. If you're a historical or genealogical society listening to Preservation Oaks, and you'd like to be a guest on the program, please email preservationoaks at gmail.com. Again, that's preservationoaks at gmail.com. Listeners, thank you for listening. You can comment anytime about the show or send suggestions by emailing preservationoaks at gmail.com. Thank you. This is Sondra Klamleininger from the Union County Genealogy Society. And I love listening to Preservation Oaks on micro stream radio. This is Ruth Armstrong from the Genealogical Society of Lynn County, Iowa, located in Cedar Rapids. And I listen to Sean Thomas Radcliffe and Preservation Oaks on micro stream radio. This is Linda Rogenkamp, treasurer of the Onega Historical Society Building Committee. And I love listening to Preservation Oaks on MicroStream Radio. And now, back to Preservation Oaks. Welcome back to Preservation Oaks. We're here today with Ms. Taylor Volts, the director of the Historic Mobile Preservation Society in Mobile, Alabama. We've learned a lot, Taylor. Thank you so much for sharing with us and welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be back. Um, what kinds of records or historical artifacts has the society received as donations from the public? We have gotten almost everything that we have from donations from the public, even the items inside the house have pretty much been gifted to us over the years. Since Oakley was owned by so many families, most of the stuff that belonged to those families, you know, of course, would be gone because they would move and take their things. And we're not like other houses, like say, for example, Ballingrath Home and Gardens here was only owned by one family. It was owned by Mr. Ballingrath and his wife. And so everything that is there is original to them and never went anywhere else. <laughs> So pretty much everything that we've had has come to us. And sometimes it's things that have come from other like family members of, you know, the people that have lived at Oakley. We get a lot of pictures from historic records and things like that. So it's pretty much all been given to us. And even 
Today, I will get emails and calls from people that say, hey, I have my great-grandmother's scrapbook. Would you like this for your archives? I have this silver spoon from this hotel and mobile that doesn't exist anymore. (laughs) And, you know, as long as we have space for it, we are happy. We are happy to take those items because it it just, all it does is add to the materials that we have. And like I said, we have the Wilson collection, which is all the photographs and the glass plate negatives as part of that collection. Several organizations have given us their meeting minutes. I mentioned the the orphanage, but there are also other organizations that we have their records and documents. We got an entire set of city directories when I believe it came from one of the libraries closed down. And they gave us city directories that span from the 80s all the way up through, I think, sometime in the 1960s. All of it, you name it, people send it to us. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. How many artifacts would you say you have in your collections? So we have roughly 1,150 artifacts in the house or things like physical things that are related to Oakley and, and pieces like that and about trouble items. And that's going to be more maps, papers, documents, and that sort of thing. You said 1,150 in the house and how many others? About 12,000. Wow. Archival items. You have an archivist mm-hmm. on staff? We just have the this. He comes in uh, about four hours a day, he um, lives nearby and just donates all of his time for free, has been for years, and we are very grateful for everything that he does. Fantastic. I know he's put a list of collections on the site. There's a link that has a list of your collections, and uh, that's a pretty comprehensive list for people to look at as well. Does your society capture oral interviews? That is something that I would like to start doing. Because I had my own podcast called Preservation Destination, still out there if anybody wants to listen to it. It's a little bit different than this one. So I have all of that stuff to record interviews. And there are a few people in Mobile that are just these repositories of information that are getting up there in age. And I'm afraid that when we lose them, a lot of that stuff is going to get lost. It's just going to be gone because they know things that, you know... So uh, I would like to start doing that. There, There's a gentleman that was named Eddie Wolf, who was designing the garage of blooms and posters and other things for years. And he just recently retired. would love to do some interviews with him and just learn all of the stuff that he's learned about Mardi Gras and these different groups over the past 30, 40 years, you know. So uh, I would love to start doing that. We have the capability. We have the storage you know, we're able to to store that digitally and then hopefully make that available to people maybe on our website somehow. So that is definitely something I would love to start doing and uh, kind of add that to my list of, of objectives for the next couple of years. I've listened to a couple of, of episodes of Preservation Destination. You do a really good job on that. And I can't wait for oh, more interviews. You. Very nice. So I imagine you're dependent on a lot of volunteers. What kind of volunteer opportunities does the society have for members and the public? All kinds of opportunities. You know, we have the the typical basic ones, helping out, just being, doing docent type stuff, giving tours of the house. You know, we also have um, occasionally opportunities in the archives. We kind of try to reserve that stuff more for interns and students that need to get those skills. But we do ha- occasionally have space to, to have help like that in the archives. We are actually fixing to upgrade. Past Perfect is the program that we use where all of our archival items get scanned into and all of our artifacts and stuff. It's, it's our collections software that we use. Very common. It's used in museums and stuff all over the place. We're in the process of upgrading that to the digital version, which is for many reasons, but I think it's, it's going to be great. And we're actually going to be recataloging a lot of stuff and updating things. And so, you know, we'll be looking for volunteers to help with that sort of stuff. We always need people to help with the yard and maintenance and things like that. That's just part of dealing with an old house on a lot of land, <laughs> and especially with trees that drop leaves 365 days a year. There's always a need for that sort of stuff. We have a beautiful garden with a fountain that needs regular maintenance. We're always looking for people to help us research things. There's so many, many opportunities. And sometimes we can come up with something if if somebody needs something specific, like again, for a student or if you need to get volunteer hours and we can always tailor things to to meet your requirements. You know, just reach out. If you want to get involved, we, we need people to help with special events. 
you know, and then you, you help out and then you basically get into those events for free, which, you know, that's always a plus. Yep. So yeah, we're always, always looking for more people can send us, we've got a form on the website. You can fill out and they'll write to me. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So if there's anybody out there, listeners who would like to volunteer, please do. Um, it's a great society. It's been there a long time and they've just got beautiful grounds, beautiful homes, beautiful artifacts. And obviously, as you know, it's well managed. Tanner, how does the society interface with other regional societies or state societies? I, I know you mentioned the historical society in the area. Are there any others that you regularly interface or collaborate with? Yeah, we we work a lot with the Mobile History Museum that's uh, located here downtown. You know, we loan them things, they loan us things. In the fall, in October, we do Morning at Oakley, which is a learning, a hands-on learning where you come and learn about Victorian mourning practices, like the type of clothes they wore, the type of funerals they had. History Museum has a coffin that they let us borrow <laughs> for that event. Wow. And we just have really, really close ties with them in lots of capacities. But we also work fairly closely with the other historic house museums here in Mobile. For example, I mentioned our Mobile Bells volunteer with us and at the Richard C.A.R. house. So we have connections with them. Sometimes we do events there. They have events with us. The same thing, uh, which is located downtown. We Recently, they had an event. They needed extra chairs, and we had lots of chairs. So they got all of our chairs. <laughs> and it's kind of hit or miss since COVID and things like that have been happening. But we're trying to get back into the regular schedule, maybe once a quarter, having all the directors of the house medium meet and have like a morning breakfast meeting. Um, we've done that once since I've been here. And I'm hoping that we can continue to do that and, and do it a little bit more often. Uh, just to share what each of us is working on and, and what the future holds. and how we can help each other and those sorts of things. We also have a really great relationship with the University of South Alabama, which a lot of people call USA, but if you're down here, they just call it South. And we get a lot of great interns from the university, a lot in the history department, public lives, um, archaeology, uh, even the people that work in the library there. We've got a really great relationship with them. You know, so, and, and that was one of the things when I started this job was, you know, HMPS, they were closed for eight months. Oakley was closed because of COVID. And, you know, there were just some issues in the years before that. And coming into this job, one of the things that I had to do was reestablishing those good relationships with the other organizations here. And I think, I think it's working. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like I've done a pretty decent job. Even yeah. the art museum, you know, we borrow things from them. It's a, it's a good community down here. It's small, but it's a good community. Yeah, I think you're doing a fantastic job, Taylor. Thank you. I would encourage any listener listening to this program, if you haven't been to Mobile and you haven't been to the historic Mobile Preservation Society, you really need to go. You really need to support them. It's a beautiful place. Taylor, what kinds of interesting books has your society published? We've done quite a few over the years. Not a lot recently, but the the organization has published some of their own, and then republished some things that were in the public sphere and stuff that was no longer under copyright. We did a booklet for the Church Street Cemetery here, which is basically who's who and where are they buried in the cemetery, which is really fascinating because Church Street was was before Magnolia Cemetery, so it's going to have the oldest and stuff in it. There were a few before the Church Street Cemetery when it when the city knew, but they, they, they've all been built over and so Church Street's the oldest one. So we, we published a book about that. And we have also published or republished a Christmas in the South in Mobile type of book where you can kind of read how the holiday used to be celebrated and then the ways the traditions have changed and things like that. And I think there's been a couple other ones, too, that they did. I'm always finding stuff <laughs> as I'm going, going through archival things. We We do have... As I mentioned earlier, Octavia Walton has those couple of books that she wrote when she was traveling, and she actually traveled all over the world. And she wrote these books called Souvenirs of Travel. And there's been completely and making those available for people to read because right now they're just archival items. And a thought of mine is possibly seeing if they're in the public sphere, and if they are, maybe having those reprinted so people can read her actual words, which I think would be would be very fascinating. So. You know, doing some more of those in the future is definitely on the list. But, of course, making sure that they're available for that. Because we don't want to violate any copyright laws. We're not here for that. Right. Can anybody buy these books that you mentioned from your website? 
Well, we don't have an online store at the moment. We sell them in the gift shop, though, if you're if you're around in person. Holy, uh, I, that's another thing that's on my list to get some stuff available online, but we're not quite to that point yet. If I call your number, can I ask for the gift shop and be transferred and then buy one that way? You would probably just talk to me or my assistant, Catherine. Uh, <laughs> it's just the two of us running the whole thing. Okay. Uh, but yeah, you can do that. You can buy things over the phone and we're, we're happy to send them to people. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for that. So what kinds of things are available to do on your society's website? You can become a member through the website. You can read some of our financial history. You can look at the archival stuff that's been scanned that's available. You can contact us. You can support us through the website, either by becoming a member or just giving a donation. You can connect to Oakley's website and get information about Oakley itself. We have a news section where I just share interesting articles about preservation and history, things that have been happening. So quite a bit of stuff that you can get on there. And we do offer PayPal. That's actually the only way you can pay through the website. So you don't have to have a PayPal account. It just It's just processed through PayPal. So you can become a member, donate, and do those things through, through PayPal. Okay, fantastic. Taylor, beyond shifting to using more technology solutions such as Zoom during the COVID lockdowns, how is your society incorporating the realities of our ever-changing modern society into community outreach exhibits, publications, and the records the society gathers and archives? I just recently got a grant that is going to cover some signage that we're going to put in the yard. And signs are going to have QR codes that you can scan from your phone and then listen to a three to five minute informational recording about uh, whatever the sign is in front of. So, so it'll be the Cox TV house, the archives, Oakley, and the barracks building. One more in the general area where we believe the original slave quarters were. And that way, when people are on the property, say, and we're not open, or they're waiting for the next tour to start, or they're just walking their dogs through, they can scan those QR codes and still get a little bit of information about each little part of the property. And of course, we're also making that video, like I mentioned, to help with our handicapped guests that can access the upstairs. It's really important to me to to have something for people to be able to watch. We may make that, uh, but it may be only for members because the tours do cost money. So, okay, how much does it cost? I kind of haven't house? quite gotten that far yet. Oh, so it's ten dollars for adults, dollars for children, and the tours are guided tours, and they take about an hour. Um, so you'll get either myself or my assistant Catherine or one of our volunteers maybe, and you'll you'll get a fully guided tour, walk you through all the rooms. Like I said, it's it's pretty immersive. You're actually in the space, not behind the velvet rope. And yeah, ten dollars for adults, five dollars for children. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for that. That's a that's a very conservative price for a nice tour like that. I think it's a good price. <laughs> yeah, it's a good price. I know we're breaking up a little bit here. Can you tell the audience about any current initiatives or needs of the society that you want the people of your area to know about and support? I would say at the moment, definitely end of year, start of the new year area where we're working on budgets and things like that. Any kind of financial contributions that they would like to make would be excellent. I mean, we're always just donations are great. Becoming a member, you know, like I said, is the easiest, cheapest way to, to help support us. You know, that's always a great option because that's just going to go towards expanding what we're able to do. And we're actually also looking to bring on an intern to help expand our, the same intern we just had, we would actually like to be able to hire her on once she finishes school. And she is specifically the segregation in the South in the early 20th century, which of course, there's a lot of that history in Mobile that's been touched. We want to be able to hire her to work on some of those projects and help us expand on that. You know, any, any sort of support like that would be amazing. Come to our event, you know, just come by and say hi, pick up, we've got local honey, we've got local jam, all kinds of great stuff in the gift shop that you can get. You know, every little thing helps. If you can't financially support, which I also totally understand, I know times are, are tight for everybody. Follow us on our stuff on Facebook and Instagram. You know, all of those little things help. The more eyeballs we can get on stuff, you know, is great. And that's all helpful too. So I don't want to just be out here like, just give us money. But, <laughs> you know, sharing things on social media, talking it up, telling your friends, all that stuff is also very helpful. So appreciate in any of those things would be great. Okay, thank you. Taylor, why is the society important to the community? 
What makes your preservation society different or unique from others? I think it's important to the community here in Mobile because there's really not another organization that does the kind of stuff that we do. You know, there are other historic house museums. None of them have a preservation entity. It's, it's just running the house museum and the property. And the other house museums don't have necessarily have archives and other things like that. And just, of course, the uniqueness would be that we've just been around for so long. <laughs> And yeah, there's there's other groups that are doing really great things. You know, the Historic Development Commission with the city, of course, maintaining our historic districts. Restore Mobile is another local organization, and they're out there doing the physical. Uh, they use a revolving fund where they restore and build homes uh, for underprivileged communities. So they're out there doing sort of the other side. We're doing advocacy and things like that, and they're doing the actual, you know, physical restorations. And then we've got individuals here, such as uh, Stephen McNair, Steve May. They're doing tax credits and helping people preserve things and restoring community areas. Like they'll help restore an entire block somewhere and and revise that. So there's a lot of that going on and um, nobody's really overlapping. Everybody's got their own little niche and everything works together. Seems to work really well. So, but I think what we do is slightly different than everybody else. And, you know, just the fact that we are able to offer the resources that we can and have the house museum and field trips and educational opportunities and fun things like the holiday home tour. You know, there's really nobody else in the area that's doing all of those types of things like we do. And the fact that we don't have any sort of uh, other society backing us like the DAR house is managed by the DAR (laughs) and the Condi Charlotte house is run by an organization called the Colonial Dame, you know, and they get support and funds from those organizations. Uh, you know, that we really don't have because we're kind of our own little thing. So I, I think we're worth just only slightly biased here. I think I think <laughs> we're worth, you know, being supported uh, just like like the other organizations are. I do, too. Fantastic. With regard to the archives, does somebody need to make an appointment or can they just stop by? To see the archives, we prefer that you would make an appointment. Just call or email and let us know what you're looking for. Because if it's something we don't have, we can go ahead and be like, I'm sorry, we don't have it. Why don't you try these other places? Because our archive is some time to, to pull out the stuff. And, um, and since he is a volunteer and he's not there all day, every day, you know, he can arrange a time to meet with you and already have the documents prepared when you arrive. So emailing is good to make an appointment. As far as tours, other stuff, you can just walk in Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4. Tours start every hour and I'm pretty much there all the time. (laughs) Fantastic. I know we've talked about a lot of different exciting things and you've got so much going on. Is there any other information or message you'd like the community or members to know about? I think this this would be more of a personal answer, I think, in but also sort of in, in in a professional capacity as well. I always advocate for trying to preserve as as much as possible. And if you're not sure how to do it or what to do, if you don't know if it, you know, if it deserves to be preserved or if it's old enough, you know, just just call, call us, call the development commission. It, it takes just a few minutes to find out the information. Preservationists are the best group of people that I know. They're always willing to share their knowledge. Don't be afraid to ask. You know, that that's kind of the biggest thing. We are here for you. We are here. We will help you in any capacity that we can. And, and don't be afraid to ask, but also please, for the love of peace, stop painting your brick. Please just don't do it. It's not good for your brick. Um, that, and that's just my own pet peeve. So <laughs> y- y'all can take that or leave. <laughs> so <laughs> people down there in Mobile are painting the outside of their homes with brick. They're painting those bricks. Oh, yeah. It's a huge trend right now is to take a brick house and paint it with like a white or a gray. That's just, that's the fashion, I guess, at the moment. And I live, I live in a, a, a mid-century neighborhood that's full of brick ranches. It's a little bit newer. My house was built in 63. We live in an MCM ranch. And every house in this neighborhood is brick, I- including mine. <laughs> but I would never think to paint the brick because it's, it's not good for your brick. It takes a relatively stable material that needs minimal, minimal care over years and years and turns it into something that you are now going to have to have regular maintenance on. And not to mention that if you're not using the right materials, but a lot of times you know, people are using these paints that breathe, and bricks breathe. 
And what happens is that paint traps the moisture behind the paint and it and deteriorate, deteriorate your bricks on the inside because the moisture can't get out. The bricks can't breathe. Right. And now you've created, you know, an issue that either you're going to have to deal with in 10 to 15 years or someone else is going to have to deal with. Then if you want to take the paint off the brick, you often will have to pressure wash or sandblast to get it off, which takes the coating off what protects it from the elements. And then that makes it soft and then that'll cause it to start to break down. And it's not one of those things that you're going to see immediately. But if you're doing this and this is like your forever home, you are going to have to deal with it someday or the people that will own it after you will have to deal with it. Yep. So I just advise people, unless you're using a lime wash or something like that, that's very breathable. Just, just don't. <laughs> I don't know where this trend came from, but half of my neighborhood is painted white or gray. And it's just personal side, preservation side. You know, of course, people are going to do what they want, but that's just my little opinion on the subject. Well, it's an opinion based on your education and experience. So I hope people will listen and do that because they will have to pay for it later. Hey, thank you, Taylor, for sitting down and sharing with us today. You know, I've learned so much, and now I have a much better appreciation of the work your society is doing and the value of it to the nation in Alabama. I'm so glad to meet you. It's truly eye-opening how much you and your society manage and how embedded and integral you all are to the community. Well, thank you. I so much appreciate you inviting me to be on the podcast. You are welcome. You deserve a lot of credit for everything you're doing. And with that, we'll end our time with our guest, Taylor Volts, the director of the Historic Mobile Preservation Society in Mobile, Alabama. Listeners, please stay tuned for my comments and wrap-up, which is coming up next. All right, once again, Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome back. It really is wonderful when you learn something new, and I do with each episode of this program. We learned so much chatting with Taylor Volts, the director of the Historic Mobile Preservation Society. She educated all of us and is a perfect fit for her role. She has a number of great ideas for future projects and initiatives, and she's going to need you all's help to get them done. When I used to travel a lot on business, I'd sometimes forget what city I was in because I'd wake up, I'd look out the hotel window, and I'd see the same fast food chains and other similar things in every city. That's why I like Mobile so much. It's unique. It doesn't look like other places. And the area has such a rich and diverse history. It's great. You folks in Mobile can be very proud of your history and your historic Mobile Preservation Society. One of the things I learned that I didn't know before is that the Mardi Gras celebration in the United States began in 1703 in Mobile, Alabama, and then went to New Orleans from there. Wow. Taylor told us about author Mike Bunn, who has written several books, but the one Taylor mentioned is entitled The 14th Colony, referring to Alabama. I'm getting a copy. It should be a good read. The Historic Mobile Preservation Society is engaged in the community and involved with so many other societies to preserve the area's history and to educate the public in their own history. That's a very worthwhile cause. The historic Oakley Complex, right in the heart of Mobile, is a true gem for the benefit of the community. You folks are sure lucky to have this place, and I hope everyone will support the society by joining, donating, visiting, and volunteering. They are preserving your past and helping everyone to understand past events. They sponsor and participate in many different events throughout the year, preservation projects, and they provide tours and maintain the Minnie Mitchell archives for the benefit of family historians, genealogists, and historians who need to find information about Mobile ancestors. This includes the Wilson Photographic Collection. The Society began in 1935 
and is a great place to be in Mobile for anyone who wants to get connected to the community and make a difference. The most pressing priorities of the historic Mobile Preservation Society is the upkeep of the homes on the property, the opening of the other historic buildings on the property that are not open now, and volunteers. Please donate, join, and volunteer at this excellent society. There's something for everyone, but they are especially seeking those who can help expand membership, use of technology, the upgrade of the Past Perfect Collections Management software, maintenance of the grounds and the buildings. You know, there are two buildings that need work before they can be open to the public. So if you can help, please let them know. The Society needs people who can do genealogy research, who can lead tours, conduct video and audio oral interviews, and expand the narratives of enslaved people. They need people to upkeep the historical markers throughout Mobile, and helping to coordinate, advertise, and administer special events at the Society. Go Mobile Bells! There's a form on the website you can use to sign up as a volunteer. This quote from Taylor, We work a lot with the Mobile History Museum. We loan them things and they loan us things. We also work closely with the other house museums in the area. We do events there and they do events with us. Another quote from Taylor. We have a really great relationship with the University of South Alabama. We get a lot of interns from the university. We were closed for eight months due to COVID. And one of the things I had to do when I came into this job was reestablish relationships with other organizations. I think we've done a pretty good job doing this. Listening to the helpful information Taylor provided about the Historic Mobile Preservation Society makes it very clear what kind of impact and asset the society is to the Mobile area. You can feel really good supporting them, volunteering, visiting, attending events, and joining them in their mission. The Society needs donations and volunteers. Please help support the Historic Mobile Preservation Society today. Taylor reviewed the funding and fundraising particulars of the Society so you know exactly where the funds are going and what the priorities are. Let me mention the contact information for the Society one last time. You can find them on the web at historicmobile.org. The physical addresses of the sites located in the historic Oakley complex are The Historic Mobile Preservation Society is at 300 Oakley Place, Mobile, Alabama 36604. The Historic Oakley House Museum is right next door at 350 Oakley Place, Mobile, Alabama 36604. Their mailing address is P.O. Box 6711, Mobile, Alabama, 36660. You can call them at 251-432-1281. You can email them at hmps at bellsouth.net. They have two Facebook pages. One is Historic Mobile Preservation Society and the other is Historic Oakley Complex. They have two Instagram pages. One is Historic Oakley. The other is Historic Mobile Preservation. Okay, now you can clearly see why the Historic Mobile Preservation Society in Mobile, Alabama is truly one of our nation's preservation oaks. All right, as usual, there were a thousand questions I could have asked during our time together, but I didn't in the interest of time. If questions occur to you and you'd like more information, please connect with the Society via the contact information provided. If you're a listener in the area the Society serves, or if you're a listener researching ancestors in the community the Society serves, and you're not already a member, please consider joining and supporting them. I really hope this information helps the audience understand how valuable the Society is to the community and what kinds of excellent benefits and services they have for their members and the public. Okay, that's a wrap for this episode. Music used today is from Scott Holmes. Symbol Bird, RKVC, Track Tribe, and Nefex. Microstream Radio is a registered trademark. You can visit us at microstreamradio.com. The broadcast is owned and copyrighted by Microstream Radio. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere without the written permission of Microstream Radio. Thanks to everybody for listening. This is Sean Radcliffe. We'll see you all next time on Preservation Hopes. <laughs>